This video we're talking about limiting reactants and percent yield. You should already be able to calculate moles, mass, number of molecules and atoms in a substance and be able to balance reactions. And by the end of this video, you should also be able to use balanced equations to determine the amount of product that will form and calculate the percent yield of the lab. So the question of the video is, in a reaction, salicyclic acid and acetic anhydride, which are drawn above, um, synthesizes or creates aspirin called acetosilicyclic acid. Woo. And so um, that reaction's written above, and what we want to know is um, chemical companies want to have the highest percent yields in order to sell their products at the most pure, like nothing else in it, and cost friendly, right? We don't want to have any excess stuff laying around. So if two grams-ish of salicyclic acid is reacting with 8.4 grams of acetic anhydride, so those are the two reactants, calculate the theoretical yield, how much you think you're supposed to get. And then using the data table on the top in the blue, calculate the percent yield. How close are you to what you should have gotten? So um, to get that, we need to see something called limiting reactants or re limiting reagents. And I'm telling you, you've actually already done this before. So first, I'm going to start you off with a real world example, and then we're going to do it with a chemistry example. In the real world example, you have at hand, at home, 20 pieces of bread, 11 cheeses, and 36 ham sandwiches. And you decided with your friends that a regular ham sandwich would be worth two pieces of bread, top and bottom, a slice of cheese, and three nice slices of ham. And no more, no less, because we want every single person to have the same sandwich so nobody has an extra meat or extra cheese. How many sandwiches can I make if I only lose the bread with unlimited other sources, if I just look at the bread? So looking at just the bread, if I have 20 pieces and I need only two per sandwich, I could have made 10 sandwiches. Let's do the same thing with the cheese in number two. Looking at just the cheese, I only need one per sandwich, but I have 11. So 11 sandwiches if I just look at cheese. And if I just look at ham, I um, need three hams per sandwich, and I have 36 on hand. So divide those, and you'll have 12 sandwiches. My question is, what? how many sandwiches could I actually make from what's given? So again, the bread was 10, the cheese was 11, and the ham was 12. So that means I can make 10 sandwiches because it's my lowest value. Everything else, it, it, that will run out, and I'll have an extra slice of cheese and probably a few extra slices of ham. So our limiting reactant, our limiter, is the bread, because it limits us to 10 sandwiches, even though cheese could have made 11 and ham could have made 12. I bet you could have figured that out on your own, right? But I was showing you the steps that we take. So the steps that we take to figure out what's going to run out is we look at each individual substance, just the bread, just the cheese, just the ham, and we calculate how much of the product we could have made with just that one piece. And then we pick the lower value. That's how we calculate limiters to make sure we have the right answer. So we're going to do the same thing but for a chemical reaction. In the chemical reaction, we want a sulfur to collide with three fluorides to make SF6. But you might have more or less of each substance. Notice that we have four sulfurs on hand and two fluorines on hand. And we want to know which one's going to limit us and how much is going to be excessive, but also how much am I actually going to make. So if we just looked at the sulfur, I needed a sulfur to make SF6, but I have four sulfurs. So if I have quadruple of sulfurs, I can make quadruple of sulfur hexafluorides, SF6. So if just based on sulfur alone, I can make four of my product. But now look at just fluorine like we did with the ham. If they look at fluorine, we need three, and we only have two. Does that mean we can't make it? In this case, we can still. We just have to make what I might equate to as a half a sandwich, right? We have to make a little less than we wanted. So what we're going to do is say that if I have two fluorines, I'm going to divide it by the three, just like I did it with the cheese and the breads, and I'm going to get a 0.6, technically repeating, and that's how much SF6 I can make from the fluorine. So fluorine says I can make 0.6 repeating moles of SF6. And uh, sulfur says I can make 4. Remember, we always picked a lower number. So that means fluorine is going to limit us at 0.6. We have an excess amount of sulfur. There's so much sulfur, we, don't, we have overload, which is not cost effective. And we're only going to make the 0.6 value. right? So I highlighted it. That's my answer. So you're, sh you're showing both works to prove that one's excessive and one's the limiting one. Let's try something a little trickier using all our dimensional analysis work. So two ammonias react with the carbon dioxide to form something called urea and water. 
and says if 637.2 grams of ammonia reacted with 1142 grams of carbon dioxide, find the limiting reactant, so which one's running out, and how much of the urea can I make? So again, let's look at just ammonia like we did with the bread. Just ammonia first. I'm going to take the 637.2 grams of ammonia, and I'm placing it over 1 and multiply by a new fraction. In that fraction, the denominator should have the same units, grams, of ammonia, which I get from the reference table by adding a nitrogen plus 3 hydrogens. That grams is equal to a mole of ammonia. I don't really want to know about ammonia, though. If you reread the question, I want to know about the mass of urea. So ammonia will go on the bottom as moles. The mole number will be 2 because that's the coefficient in the balance equation. And for every two ammonias, I can make one urea. Rather than writing the reaction, the NH2-2CO out, I wrote urea. You could do whatever you'd like. So for every two ammonias, I make one urea. It's very similar to saying for every three hams, I made one bread. Yeah? And then moving on from there, I actually wanted to know the mass of the urea, not the moles. So again, moles will go county corner to the bottom. And for every mole of urea, I'm going to add up two nitrogens, four hydrogens, a carbon, and an oxygen to get 60.062 grams. I'm going to divide by 17, divide by 2, and times by 60 to say that if I used all the ammonia I have on hand, I theoretically could have made 1,123 grams of urea. But what I'm not factoring by just that work is how much carbon dioxide I have. So now I have to do the same work, but for carbon dioxide. I'm going to start with 1142 grams of carbon dioxide. I'm going to find out how much it weighs by adding carbon plus two oxygens on the bottom of the next fraction and say that's equal to a mole of CO2. On my equation, for every one CO2 in the equation, I get one urea. So that's a one to one mole ratio. And the last part is very similar to both. You've already done this work. For every mole of urea, it's 60.062 grams. I'm going to divide 1142 by 44. And I'm going to ignore the ones because they're really not important. And I'm going to times it by 60.062 to get 1,559 grams. So even though I had a lot more CO2, almost double, I don't make almost double the urea because the CO2 weighs more, right? So it's, it's kind of, um, we have to take into account how much each substance weighs and how much it, you need to use. I needed to use twice as much ammonia. I only needed to use one CO2. So um, in that case, looking at the two answers, I'm going to pick the lower value, the 1123 grams of urea is what's going to be produced in theory if I do everything perfect. Percent yield tells you how accurate you are. In a lab, you will not necessarily create the exact amount because of errors in your lab. And percent yield calculates how close you were to your theoretical or calculated amount. And it's very simple. You write your actual mass on the top that you created in the lab, and you divide by the theoretical or calculated based number. Uh, it's kind of similar to if you took a top 20 and you got 15 right, you do 15 divided by 20 to figure out what your percentage is. It's exactly the same idea. So if we recall that the theoretical yield was 1123 in the previous example, and in the previous lab only 1,000 was created, how good were you? We're going to take that 1,000, we're going to divide by the 1123 times 100, because that's what you do for every percent, and you got 89%, which I actually think is pretty good. You made 89% of what you should have made. Percent yields over 85 are generally considered accurate enough. So let's try it one more time, all together now. Five calciums and a V2O5 react to form calcium oxide five times and two Vs. If you have on hand 1960 grams of calcium and 1540 grams of V2O5, we want to know which one limits, so which one runs out of those two chemicals, and how much V can you make. So starting with calcium, over one, I had 1960 over one. Grams is going to be catty quartered, finding it from the reference table. Calcium weighs 40.08 grams for every mole. In the equation, the calcium had a coefficient of 5, and for every 5 calciums, I can make 2 Vs, because that's what's in the equation, 5 to 2 ratio. For every V on my reference table, I'm going to find the molar mass at 50.94. I'm going to do 1960 divided by 40 times 2 divided by 5 times 50. Remember, you multiply the tops and divide the denominators. And my answer is 996 for this calculation. That's showing me that if I use all my calcium, this is how much V I could make. But I need to see our competitor. Our competitor V205 is 1540 grams. On the reference table, when I add the V2 and the O5 together, I get 181.88 grams uh, for every mole of V205. V205 in the equation above only has a one mole. For every one mole of V205, you get two Vs. Uh, also in the equation, but also in the, in the symbol, right, V205. And for every V, it weighs 50.94. Notice that in the both examples we've done, since we're converting to the same thing, the last fraction is the same.
I'm going to divide by 181 times 2 times 50. I got 862. So um, that means, since I put in a red as my answer, because it's a lower value. That means V205 is my limiter. And the amount I'm going to make is 852. And if in the lab I actually made 803, how close am I to the right answer? So I'm going to do 803, given in the lab, divided by 862 in my theory, times 100 is 93%. I did pretty well. So going back to the question of the video, this is our reaction. Blue stuff is what we actually got in the lab. But what I used was 2009 grams of salicyclic acid and 5.4 grams of acetic anhydride. So we're going to start with the salicyclic at 2 grams. We're going to divide by how much it weighs. Notice that every corner is a carbon. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 carbons. 1, 2, 3 oxygens. Hydrogens are tricky. Each carbon has to bond twice. So there is 1, 2, but actually one of those is a double bond. That's why there's a circle here. So 3, and that means each of these is not showing it, but there's a hydrogen on each of these. It's called a benzene ring. Benzene with C6H6. So I'm going to say there's 1, 2, 3, 4 imaginary hydrogens, 5, 6. And if I add all of that up, its molar mass was 138.1. Don't worry, we'll practice with benzene more often. And there you needed only one of those in order to create aspirin. So a one-to-one -one ratio. And then aspirin, same thing, has that benzene ring, C6H6. So there are six carbons in this ring. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two up here and one down there. There's nine carbons. One, two, three, four oxygens. And watch out for the imaginary hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. When you add that up, it weighs 180.2. And so I multiplied and divided, and I got 2.621. That's only if I use all the salicyclic acid. Let's do it with acetic anhydride. Similar thing with acetic anhydride, it's easy, easier. I can see the C's, H's, and O's. So 1, 2, 3, 4 C's plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 H's and 1, 2, 3 oxygens. Weighed 102.1 grams for every acetic anhydride. I got a little lazy here writing the names out because it fits better. You can do whatever you want when you label it. For every acetic anhydride, I make one salicyclic, acetosalicylic aspirin, right, aspirin. And then I say for every aspirin, it weighs 108.2. 180.2. I multiply and divide, and I get 9.531. So what this is showing me is that the SA, or salicyclic acid, ran out first, and the only amount I can make is 2.621 grams. And that means I have an excessive amount of acetic anhydride. Um, maybe that's a good thing, but that generally companies don't want you to have excess because it costs them money to have excess, right? Sitting around doing nothing. So, and also, let's see how close we are to the right answer. So we have filtered paper and filtered paper with a product on top. So what we have to do is subtract the filtered paper out and then divide what we got in the lab by what we got in the calculation, times 100. I did okay, but what we were looking for is something a little bit better. The only way to make this number better is to make sure, to ensure that you reacted everything to fruition, that you've um, filtered everything perfectly, and that you've dried everything perfectly. Not by adding more stuff. Adding more stuff will change all those numbers, right? All I want to do is change the numerator to make it better, not the theoretical yield. At this point, use the balance equations to determine the amount of product to a form and calculate percent yield.